This is part two of The Jewish Faction by Joseph Sobrin. The tribe's obloquy long predates the Third Reich's propaganda. Government libel campaigns, a feature of the modern world of mass communication, rarely succeed for long. Even popular myths die out over time. But a durable reputation, lasting over many centuries, is hard to account for unless it contains some truth confirmed by experience. Few Christians have said that the Jews killed Christ. They have always said that the Jews rejected Christ, as indeed Jews still do. The tribe itself makes rejecting Christ a defining feature of Jewishness, even more than adhering to Judaism. Where does the charge of Christ-killing show up in Christian culture? I have done a bit of spot-checking in English literature during the Christian era in three famous stories about Jews. The Prioress's Tale in the Canterbury Tales of Geoffrey Chaucer is a pious fable about a small boy whose throat is cut by malicious Jews who then throw the little corpse into a pit. The story is designed to put the Jews in a bad light by contrasting Christian piety with inhuman Jewish cruelty. Yet it says nothing about the Jews having killed Christ. The most famous and fascinating Jewish character in secular literature is Shakespeare's Shylock in The Merchant of Venice. He is a villain, but he also speaks his piece so eloquently that readers are still divided over his creator's attitude toward him. Is he more victim than villain? At any rate, one thing is clear. Though Shylock's Christian enemies call him a bloodthirsty usurer, a wolf, misbeliever, cutthroat dog, and so forth, none of them, even in their most violent vituperation, suggest that he is guilty of killing Christ. The idea of Jewish guilt for the crucifixion, which Krauthammer insists obsessed Christians for almost two millennia, never even crosses their minds. More important for our purposes, Shakespeare doesn't connect Shylock with the crucifixion either. Shylock speaks of Christ and Christians with brusque contempt. He is tortured by his daughter's elopement with a Christian, but for all his cruelty, he never adverts to the crucifixion. The play assumes enmity between Christians and Jews, but not the sort the tribe's rhetoric would lead us to expect. An even more telling example is another play of the period, The Jew of Malta, usually ascribed to Christopher Marlowe. Its chief character, Barabbas, is an uninhibited exaggeration of the villainous Jew. He walks abroad at night, poisoning wells for the sheer, gleeful pleasure of it. He poisons his own daughter for becoming a Christian nun. His cunning malice, comic in its sheer extremity, knows no bounds. In contrast to Shylock, Barabbas is robustly implausible. Yet nowhere in the play is there any hint of the theme of Christ-killing. That would be beyond even this absurd Christian fantasy 
of the hate-crazed Jew. And of course, Charles Dickens created an unforgettable Jewish villain, Fagin in Oliver Twist. Though far from inhuman, he is certainly disreputable, teaching urchins to pick pockets and receiving stolen goods. Dickens usually refers to him simply as the Jew. But again, there is no hint that this Jewish rascal bears any guilt for the crucifixion. Hilaire Belloc and G.K. Chesterton, two of the greatest Catholic writers of the last century, were often critical of the Jews. Each wrote a book about them, and today are routinely referred to as anti-Semites. Neither of them accused the Jews of killing Christ. In fact, both sought solutions to the Jewish problem, which would be fair to Christians and Jews alike. Chesterton was pro-Zionist, Belloc anti-Zionist, and both spent many pages defending the Jews against common charges. But neither of these alleged bigots thought the accusation of deicide was worth mentioning, either to assert or to refute. In truth, the charge of Christ-killing is hard to find anywhere, outside of schoolyard taunts. Yet, the tribe remembers it, just as innumerable baseball fans used to remember seeing Babe Ruth's legendary and apocryphal called shot in the 1932 World Series, the most famous home run never hit. Such non-happenings are a regular feature of tribal memory, as witness the many testimonies of Holocaust survivors that have turned out to be delusions or outright forgeries. A large proportion of the tribe is still absolutely convinced that Pius XII was Hitler's pope, despite mountainous and mounting evidence to the contrary. Hitler's media called Pius the Jew's mouthpiece. Similar bogus memories of victimization surround the state of Israel. Far from facing extinction in 1948, Zionist Jews enjoyed great military superiority to the Arabs and ruthlessly drove the native Palestinians from their homes with liberal applications of terrorism. Since then, the Jewish state has behaved according to the harshest Jewish stereotypes, deceitfully, parasitically, and cruelly. It was supposed to provide Jews with a safe haven from persecution, where they could at last be self-sufficient. Instead, it has depended for its survival on foreign aid, chiefly American. Proclaiming democracy and equality, it has imposed racial tyranny of the sort the tribe roundly condemns everywhere else. And it has failed in its whole original purpose of ensuring Jewish safety. Despite its military power and nuclear arsenal, it has engendered such hatred among Arabs that Jews are afraid to go there and fret for its survival. Even as they fret about non-existent Christian anti-Semitism in pro-Israel America. 
As the good book says, quote, The guilty flee when no man pursueth. Unquote. Zionism has vividly shown that the tribe is perfectly capable of making enemies without the help of the Christians it still, after almost two millennia, loathes. What is the source of this deep, enduring hatred of Christianity? No doubt there are several. An obvious one is the Church's claim to be the new Israel, a spiritual one, supplanting the old ethnic one. Even many secular Jews resent supersessionist Christian theology. It's apparently an affront to be replaced as God's chosen people, even if you no longer believe in God. This offense is avenged by blaming Christians, especially popes, for the Holocaust, any doubt of which the tribe treats as heresy. In many Western countries, the tribe has succeeded in criminalizing the expression of such doubts. Moreover, Christianity's universality has given it a worldwide appeal that Judaism, by its nature, can never enjoy. This consigns the tribe to a permanent minority status, confounding its proud expectation that with the coming of the Messiah, it would rule all nations. Worse, Christians take it for granted that their ethic is immeasurably superior to that of the Jews. This isn't even debatable, for the tribe can find no ground for persuading Christians that the Jewish ethos is better. Just as the dwarf is obsessed with height in a way people of normal size can hardly imagine, the tribe is obsessed with its marginal minority status, which it experiences as victimization, imagining slights and insults, anti-Semitism, even when none are intended. Its inverted pride expresses itself in claims of persecution. The Jews are still chosen, if only for a singular Christian hatred. The emergence and military power of the Zionist state have partly assuaged this ressentiment, while Arab hatred and Western disapproval have also reinforced the feeling of persecution. A subtle twist on this theme is offered by John Murray Cudahy in his book, The Ordeal of Civility. For the Jews, argues Cudahy, adapting to the modern West has indeed been an ordeal as they have found themselves regarded as backward and crude against the refined standards of Western Christian man. Such Jewish ideologies as Marxism and Freudianism are disguised apologias for the Jews, denying the superiority of Western standards. For Marx, capitalism boils down to mere greed, while for Freud, romantic love boils down to mere lust. Both view Western manners as mere hypocrisy, self-deluding airs put on by the goyim. Marxist and Freudian reductionism have had tremendous attraction for Jewish intellectuals, and not a few Gentiles who feel alienated from the Christian world. 
The exaltation of alienation has been the distinctive achievement of the tribal intellectual. To be alienated is to be superior, chosen. There is something richly symbolic in the creation of the State of Israel, where an alien population has claimed the right to dispossess the native one. Here is the psychic tribal drama played out in the real world, with the usurpers of Palestine brazenly calling their regime a democracy, while feeling victimized by the angry population they've robbed and murdered. President Bush sometimes says that minority children suffer from the soft bigotry of low expectations. They get the message that nobody expects them to achieve anything, so they don't even try. The very term minority now signifies a group not only recognized as having what Cudahy nicely calls accredited victim status, but felt to be incapable of meeting normal standards of conduct. Polish Americans, for example, are a numerical minority, but not a minority in this subtly condescending sense. One might also speak of a soft anti-Semitism of low moral expectations. Most Gentiles respect Jews for their intelligence and ability, but they have also come to take certain kinds of Jewish misbehavior for granted. Israeli racial supremacism is assumed as inseparable from Israel's right to exist. Loose Jewish charges of anti-Semitism, especially against Christians, are likewise so predictable as to cause little surprise or outrage. In public life, at least, the tribe has embraced this baneful form of minority status, and the implicit contempt that goes with giving up hope of normal civility. As with other minorities, the Christian habit with the tribe is simply to pretend not to notice obvious and distressing things. This, we assume, is just their nature. They aren't going to change. Maybe they can't help being this way. This is what interfaith dialogue has come to, Christian despair and surrender.